I'm ready. You got a second date. The goals are different now. Goals on the second date? Um, you get a third date. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the albatrossy. Okay. I'm Morgan Jonas. I'm Josh Boudreau. And I'm Noel Cathcart. And we are the Indianapolis Zoo. Mm -hmm. And so, when was the last time you went to the zoo? Today we will be teaching you all about the zoo and all the activities it has to offer. Most people think that the zoo is there for only entertainment, but in reality it's also there to teach us too. There are times where it can be just for your entertainment, like when I went one time and the polar bears were acting up so that it run in and tranquilize them all. Or, the zoo, is re the zoo is also really meant to teach you about nature and the animals that is in the nature. Uh, the main reason that they created the zoo is to teach us about how the humans affect our ecosystems. This goal is usually accomplished because they have over one million guests per year that they have the opportunity to teach. So do you think the zoo that is really important to our community? Today you will hear about the history of the zoo from Morgan, some of the attractions from Josh, and the mission from me. We want, you to, we want to acknowledge you so next time you notice more details while you're at the zoo. Now Morgan will talk to you about the history. Okay, so the concept of bringing a zoo to Indianapolis started in the 1940s. And this campaign was started by Lowell Nussbaum. He was a newspaper columnist for the Indianapolis Star and the Indianapolis Times. And he wrote about this want for a zoo in his newspaper columns. So during World War II, momentum for the zoo slowed. But Nussbaum and the other original founders continued to plan out the zoo and collect animals. So construction at Washington Park in downtown Indianapolis started in 1962 in August. And this is two decades after the original planning had started. Opening day for the Washington Park Zoo was on April 18, 1964, on East 30th Street, and it covered 20 acres. So this is a picture of the main entrance at the zoo, and then that is a picture of Lowell Nussbaum, the founder. So the exhibits at the Washington Park Zoo included an elephant, raccoons, bison, and turtles. In 1965, it was one of the only zoos to have a full-time education staff. On its 20th anniversary, the zoo had doubled the amount of animals that it started out with. And the Washington Park Zoo was open for 23 years, and its closing day was on no November 1st, 1987. It had 270,000 guests its first year, and 5.5 million in its lifetime. So now that we've talked about the zoo's original founder, its exhibits, and its lifetime statistics, it is now time to move on to the new current Indianapolis Zoo. Okay, this video is a commercial from 1998 for the new zoo. conservation and education and not just a place for looking at animals. In September of 1985, construction began at the White River State Park in downtown Indianapolis. It cost $64 million to build and it was five times larger than the old zoo. And it took weeks for the zoo's workers to relocate the 500 animals at the old zoo. Yeah. 
You might have to actually click play on this. So the new zoo opened on June 11, 1988. The admission was $10, and this included all of the opening day festivities. In 1996, the zoo became the first to be triple credited as a zoo, aquarium, and botanical garden. It hosts over 1 million guests per year. And along with the new zoo expansion, the White River Gardens were also added to the zoo. So this is a picture of opening day at the zoo, and then that is a moving sign from the old zoo. Okay, the White River Gardens. Construction began in October of 1997, <coughs> and it opened on June 13, 1999. And the White River Gardens were actually a separate attraction from the zoo until 2006 when they were merged. So far, we have learned about the first Indianapolis Zoo and its founder, the new zoo, and the addition of the White River Gardens. Now, Josh will tell you about the zoo's attractions, exhibits, and events. All right, so. I'm Josh, and I'll be talking to you about the, uh, some of the events and the attractions at the zoo. So, um, at the zoo there's around 250 species of animals and over 2,000 species of plants. And um, all the animals are split up into their uh, certain biomes. And there's four biomes, the desert, the forest, the ocean, and the plains. And uh, first I'll be talking to you about the desert biome. So, uh, they call this one the desert dome. Um, creatively because it's a dome and inside is desert animals and um, uh, all year round they keep it uh, the temperature inside about uh, 82 to 85 degrees for the animals and um, there's all different types um, a lot of reptiles and uh, some little uh, furry creatures um, there's a bunch of different snakes and lizards in there um, I'd name them off but it'd take a while and then they also have finches meerkat as you can see um, and some turtles and some tortoises. And then the next one, or the next biome is the forest. And um, the forest is, it's a pretty big part of the zoo. Um, it's full of trees and uh, vegetation to make it feel like you're actually in the forest. Um, this also has a very wide variety of animals, um, such as uh, bears, tigers, bald eagles, lemurs, and red pandas, just to name a few of the big ones. Um, the next biome is the ocean biome, and uh, this is a large attraction at the zoo. Um, so when you first walk in, you come up to a, a shark tank, which um, is actually the largest uh, shark tank that you can pet the sharks in in the nation. Um, so a lot of the kids and people go up and they get to pet the sharks, which is pretty cool how they have that interactive element um, there. And um, as you walk through, you see all sorts of <coughs> fish and uh, different types of animals that live in the water, like jellyfish and eels and uh, seahorses and all that. And then, as you near the end of this exhibit, um, you get to more of the marine mammals, like the polar bears and the dolphins and the seals and the penguins and all that stuff. Um, and then, then the next biome is the plains, and uh, this biome. It's another big one. Um, it's got all sorts of trees and tall grass to make it feel like you're on an African safari. And um, again, there's plenty of animals on this one, um, like cheetahs and giraffes and elephants and lions and zebras and gazelle. Um, you can also feed the giraffes, as you can see. Um, so that's just another interactive element that the zoo has. And then. Uh, so those are some of the exhibits, and then now we're gonna I'm gonna talk about some of the attract or some of the attractions that they have there. So um, the first main one is the Dolphin Show, which I'm sure you've all all heard of. Um, it's real popular there. They have multiple shows there every day. Um, so the trainers uh, go out and they uh, tell the dolphins to do the tricks that they've taught them, and while they're doing their tricks. Uh, they talk to you about, um, they just give you some facts about dolphins in general and then um, some conservation of the dolphins and how you can help them out in the ocean and stuff. Um, and now there's a video of this um, clip of the dolphin show. Thanks to Captain Lyon. 
David Lawrence, and he's currently swimming with his mom, big sister, and a few other females and another young male. So now that you've met the third Marshall, we'll turn it over to them and let them show off for you. Me? You go easy, yeah? Christmas at the zoo, and um, so in 1967, um, the Indianapolis Zoo was the first zoo to have a holiday light event at, uh, at the zoo. So um, they put up all types of Christmas lights, and um, uh, visitors come and they can walk around the zoo and just see all the lights and see some of the animals that are still out. And um, they can have hot chocolate or coffee or whatever while they're walking around. And um, so that's the Christmas at the zoo and some of the events and attractions there. So now Noah will talk to you more about the conservation of the zoo. All right, so the main mission of the zoo is really, as you see in the pictures, is go green and recycling. And so they, they really made the zoo to kind of teach you all about, as he said, all the animal species and their biomes, as well as ways that you can save our ecosystems by going on in your everyday life as well, still though. Some examples of going green, as they would say, is reusing energy, like solar panels, or using hybrid cars. Um, another part of the mission is to teach, as I just said, teach you about the animals and their habitats. Like Josh said, there are so many that you can look at, you can really go for a day or two, however long you want, and learn so much about everything there. They want you to know that the real reason our ecosystems and habitats are getting harmed is because of us, our humans. One way that they, the zoo itself goes green is by reusing the oil that they make fries with, as you'll see in this video in a second. Only at the Indianapolis Zoo. Well, I think the most beneficial thing that we can do with this biofuel initiative here at the zoo is to talk to our guests about what biofuel is, to demonstrate to them that we can reuse some of our resources. This oil starts out as fryer oil in our concessions areas, um, in Cafe in the Commons primarily. And so that oil is collected by our concession staff and our facility staff then takes that, takes it over to the biofuel processing unit and through a chemical process actually converts batches of the used fry oil into the biodiesel. We're simply testing the utilization of the biofuel in some of our Kubotas, which are our on-grounds vehicles that we use for maintenance and that type of thing. Right now, we're simply in the kind of the startup stage, testing this out, making sure it works in the existing vehicles we have. One of the main reasons we partnered with the Indianapolis Zoo is the broad reach that the zoo has with, one, its conservation message, but two, all of the visitors that can come here on an annual basis. So it's a great opportunity to teach a lot of people, and if in any way they can reduce, reuse, or recycle within their own lives, the, you know, the better. 
the more we can do to educate people and empower them to then go home and make choices. They may not be making biofuel, but it might spark conversation around the dinner table. How can we be more effective with this? What can we do to help conservation? want to spark your imagination of what you can try to do to help out the ecosystems. Even if that means just one little thing at a time, like buying a hybrid car, riding your bike instead of driving one day, or taking the train. And in the end, the, the zoo just wants to bring communities together so that you can get, become closer as well, <coughs> having a fun time and learning about the ecosystem.